Well, good morning, y'all. We're so glad to have y'all with us. We are in 1 John. Sorry that wasn't made clear on the notes, but I'm telling you now, so it's all good. But we're finishing up our study of 1 John today, actually. We've been going through this for, I don't know, a couple months, at least maybe a few months. Anyways, it's been a really good verse-by-verse study, and we're going to finish today with part 11. Do I got that right, Scott? Is it part 11? Okay. I corrected my error from last week. So the title of today's message is The Fellowship's Duty and Discipline. So this whole book, 1 John, is about fellowship with God, and so that's why I titled the series Fellowship Divine. And John gives us his purpose statement in the first chapter. He says, I've, ri- I've written these things to you so that your joy may be full. And so that's the design of the book, having fellowship with God so your joy as a Christian can be full. So we're going to start reading in verse 14. But, you know, let's back up, actually, and let's start in verse 13 because I want you all to be able to see the connection. These letters were meant to be read in one setting. Somebody, I'm sure, would stand in front of a congregation, and whenever they got a letter from Paul or John, they would read through the entire letter. Now, we didn't do that, but I do want to go back a little bit. So, verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, we talked about assurance last week and how John is reminding his audience that in order to have eternal life, they needed to believe in Jesus. He's already said that they had done that. He's made that clear throughout this letter. And so he's repeating this so that way they can have assurance of eternal life. Now, in verse 14, it flows well because he says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So we're able to have confidence that God hears us, because we've believed on the name of Jesus, and we have eternal life. And he's going to talk about being begotten of God, being born again. And so knowing that you're born again, knowing that you have eternal life, is where you get your confidence to go to God in prayer. And so here he says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now, earlier on, In 1 John, it was chapter 3, verse 22. John says, And whatever, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So one of the principles that we learned already is that if you have fellowship with God, then God is going to listen to your prayers favorably. As parents, many of us in here, you know, being parents, um, we understand this principle that if a child is obeying you and respecting you and honoring you, then you're going to be more inclined to listen to their request. And we're not talking about the essential needs. You know, I do. Can I have food? You know, can I have a glass of water? We're talking about, you know, can I, you know, go and spend the night with my friends? Can I have this prize? If your child has been obedient to your commands, then you're going to be inclined to say yes. However, there's a caveat. And that's what John is bringing up here. He says, if we ask anything according to his will. And so there's another principle here, and that principle is sometimes when we ask for something, God says no, not because we're not being obedient, um, but because it's not in his plan, and God knows what's best. There are times when my kids ask for things, and they've been really good, and I think they deserve this, but it's not good for them right now. There are reasons why they can't have it when they want to have it. And so if we have these two things in mind, then we can have confidence when we go to God. That everything that we ask God, if we are walking in the light, if we're in fellowship with him, and what is fellowship? That's what we talked about throughout this series. But to kind of wrap it up, I've repeated again and again, the fellowship with God is simply having sound doctrine pertaining to who Jesus is. So that was one of the big issues with this congregation. They were being taught by the Gnostics. They're revisionists of sort. You know, they come in there saying, well, we believe in Jesus too, but this is actually the right doctrine about Jesus. And so John clears that up and tells us that Jesus is God in the flesh, that Jesus is not a man who had the Christ spirit. Jesus is the Christ himself. And so these were some false doctrines that were floating around that John had to correct. But if you have the right doctrine about who Jesus is and what he did for you, and you're loving your brethren, those two things are just repeated again and again throughout this book, then you know you're walking in fellowship with God. 
And so if you're walking in fellowship with God and you go to him in prayer and he doesn't answer your prayer the way you expected, John is reminding us here that maybe that's because your request, even though it wasn't necessarily bad, it wasn't in his will. There are other factors involved when God answers our prayers, how it's going to affect other people around us. And that's a, a fabric or a tapestry that we can't wrap our minds around as humans. Kids can't wrap their minds around what we as adults know. And we shouldn't forget that the same applies for our relationship with God. I mean, even more so, God is our father, but he's infinitely above us in terms of his thoughts and his knowledge. And so whenever we ask God for something, we could say, well, this makes sense to me. Like, God, I pray that you will open up a door for me to go do this. And it's something you have a desire to do. Maybe that's a really good desire. Like, let's go on the mission field. Let's go here because I feel like a need could be met by me here. The Lord could use me here. And so you ask God to open up that door. And maybe God says no. And you wonder, well, why did you do that, God? Maybe it's just not the right time. Me and Scott were talking about this last night. And, and God's done that for me in the past. I mean, I've asked God, God, please open up a door for me to go to seminary when I was wanting to go to seminary. And I couldn't afford it. It was expensive. I know my nana and uh, my grandfather, we called him Ditta. He basically said, I, I'd love to be able to help you go to this college, but it's just too expensive. And it was it's outrageously expensive. And it's even gone up <laughs> in tuition since I was there. But at the time, I was frustrated a little bit with God because I was asking him, to do something that I thought made sense. Like, this has got to be your will, right? I mean, you want me to preach. I knew that he'd call me to that. You want me to be trained. This is a wonderful school to do that. Sound doctrinally, very mission-minded. So why not this school? Went to another school that didn't have anything. For That's right. And, and I, I didn't actually attend classes there, but yeah, I had signed up for it. I still have my Dalton State t-shirt. I still wear it. And people were like, oh, you went to Dalton? No, no, I just got the t-shirt. <laughs> so anyways, um, I, I was like, we're going to Dalton because God has not given me an answer. And so I'm just going to walk in faith. And I'm, I'm a little confused as to why God has not given me the details, but I waited on him. And eventually he said yes. But for a time, he was saying no, because it just wasn't the right time. And I think that a lot of that has to do with me, uh, us as individuals. Maybe God is testing us. And a lot of people don't like to think about God that way. But, I mean, we do test our children. We give them opportunities to serve. We challenge them, don't we? If we never challenge them, they're never going to grow. And so we know how much of a challenge we should give. Like, some challenges are not appropriate for them at this time, right? And God knows best when it comes to his children. And so whenever we go to God in our prayers, and this is the first point, we can be sure that God always listens favorably to the prayers of the faithful. Now, it is possible that if you ask God for something and you're sinning against him in your life and you're not loving the brethren, okay, that's the chief thing that he's you know, really focusing all throughout this letter on, the love for the brethren, then God might say, no, I'm not going to give that to you right now. Okay, you don't have a right to it. This, this is something that I'd love to give you, but I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to do something. You're not ready for it. And um, quite frankly, you don't deserve it. And that is a fact that we as children of God may be in a place in our life where we ask God for something and God says, no, I'm actually disciplining you right now. I'm chastising you right now because I'm trying to teach you a lesson. And we never like as parents to do that, but we have to do that sometimes. We have to discipline our kids. And there are, there are different ways to do that. But the point is, the discipline is God trying to make us into a better Christian, a more consistent child of God. When you are a child of God, when you're born again by believing on the name of Jesus, you have a new nature. But that new nature doesn't always express itself in your life because we sometimes listen to what Scripture calls the flesh, our sin nature. And that has been fully eradicated. Some people don't like calling it sin nature. Uh, they hold to what's called the one nature view. We don't have a sin nature anymore. They'll say that maybe it's external influence. But according to scripture, it does seem that Paul in Romans 7 says that I have two laws or two principles that are at war within me. So the inner man, the real me, always delights in the law of God. But I've got something else. That, that sin at work in my members, he says, the flesh, that it, it hinders me. And he says... You know, God, I pray that you'll deliver me from this. And of course, he's looking forward to the return of Christ. Chapter 8 talks all about the return of Jesus, how we're going to be liberated from our corrupt flesh and no longer be in bondage in any sense of the term. So 
Sometimes God tests us so that way we can be more like his children, be what we really are in him. And so that first point is God always listens favorably to the prayers of the faithful. Now, let's move on to verse 16, if Jamie lets us. If any man see his brother, if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So a couple observations about these verses, and these are verses that quite honestly are pretty controversial. I mean, whenever you're looking at the commentaries, there's a diversity of views about it. Um, but when you compare certain texts with this one, I think the picture becomes more clear, as I'm going to demonstrate in a moment. But the first thing we need to point out is he says, if any man see his brother... Okay, so he's talking about children of God. He talks about being born again, being begotten of God spiritually. That's uh, called regeneration in scripture. And so when you are born again, your spirit is washed and clean by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwells you. And so here he's talking about people who've had that experience apparently because he calls them brothers. He doesn't say they appear to be a brother. He says, if you see a brother that's sinning a sin that does not lead to death, he shall ask, you shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And then he says there's a sin that is unto death, okay? So there are two different types of sin here. Um, if you look at the Greek, there's no definite article, so it seems to be categorizing sin generally. So there's sin, there's a kind of sin that doesn't lead to death. And here, lead is not actually in the Greek, it's there's a sin that's not to death. So it seems to be that there's a type of sin that does not immediately result in death. We'll define that in a minute. And there's a type of sin that does immediately result in death. So let's look at some passages, two passages in particular, that I think clarify this, and the picture will become a little bit easier to wrap our minds around. So in 1 Corinthians 11, if y'all will turn there for me, this is a passage that I've actually shared this with some people, and they seem surprised. They didn't know that it was there. But in... 1 Corinthians 11, let's see where we're going to start. Um, we'll start in verse 26. This is talking about the Lord's Supper, about communion. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation. Now, damnation at the time the King James was written referred to any guilty sentence in a court of law. So if someone was tried guilty in the courtroom, then it would be referred to as damnation. So damnation here, um, it, it seems to be in modern English, connoting the idea of eternal separation from God. And um, it appears that it's not talking about that here, as you'll see. So it says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, which is a euphemism for death. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned the world. So that last verse right there is pretty important. We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. And again, I'm not going to go into all the Greek here. It would take too much time to do that. But there's a distinction between being chastened and being condemned in verse 32. So these people who were weak and sickly, and ultimately many of them had died physically, they are being chastened of the Lord. And there are other examples of this happening a little bit more rapidly the story of ananias and sapphira uh, lying to the holy spirit and rapidly struck down by god one after the other in fact um, that seems to be in the same category of thought that paul's referring to here another passage that i want us to look at is james chapter 5 so if you'll turn to james chapter 5 in the future i intend on doing a study on james 5 it's talking about anointing with oil it's talking about healing we're not going to get sidetracked by that right now, but I do want to show that in this particular context, 
sickness can be, not always, but can be associated with sin. So in James 5, verse 14, it says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So in this context, it's clear that sickness does not always point back to some spiritual failure. That's very clear in the Bible. I mean, in fact, if we talk about the man who was blind that Jesus healed in the Gospel of John, you know, whose sin? Was it his parents? Was, was it him? And Jesus basically said, it's not because of any particular sin. This is to show the glory of God. So in James 5, it's possible that somebody could be brought before the church, and the reason they are sickly, weak, and in danger of dying physically is because they have sinned against God, and they have not yet confessed their faults. And so in 1 John chapter 5, when it's talking about seeing your brother that's sinning a sin that does not lead to death, it's most likely the case that this is talking about someone who is sinning against God, okay? And I'm sure that we could know from our own experience of Christians that we were friends with, we were close with, and in church, actively serving God, and then they went off, okay? And they went astray. In that case, it could be that God is going to patiently abide with their sin, okay, convicting them in hopes to draw them back to himself. And in that case, we should pray for them. I mean, the main point that we should take from this point too is prayer should focus on the spirituality of our brethren. Prayer should focus on the spirituality of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So a lot of times when we pray, we generally jump first to the physical demands of life, and we should pray for those. I mean, Paul talked about praying for him. He was in prison. Okay, um, We should pray for people who are sick. The Bible just told us about that in James chapter 5. But John here, when he talks about loving the brethren and praying to God on their behalf, the first thing that comes to mind for him is sin in their life. And whenever we are praying for our brethren's spiritual health, we should obviously be thinking about our own spiritual health, right? And this is actually an important practice. I think that whenever we are in the Word of God, whenever we have a very firm prayer life with God, it makes us very sensitive to our own sin. Generally, people who are living in sin and carnality, they will avoid praying and they will avoid reading the Bible and they will avoid fellowship with Christians because they know that they're at odds with God. But people that are surrounding themselves by that influence, if they're basking in the light, they're very much aware when there is sin in their life. And that's the whole point. Walking in the light gives us the ability to have God show us what things we need to repent of, what things we need to confess to God. And so this is talking about someone who is sinning a sin that apparently um, is not going to lead to some sudden judgment of God like described in James 5 or 1 Corinthians 11. He does say there is a sin unto death. I, I do not say that he shall pray for it. What John seems to be saying there is if a person is sinning against God to such an extent that they are being convicted and they are quenching the spirit, they are grieving the spirit, then he might just very well say no to your prayers on their behalf and say, this is between me and my child and I'm going to take this child out of the world. It's like someone driving down the road with their kids in the back and saying, look, I'm giving you a warning. If you don't stop, then I'm turning this car around and we're going home. And that has happened to me growing up. Uh, certain times my mom would give me a warning. One time in particular, um, me and my brother were arguing over a Pokemon card. Okay. And this is when Pokemon first came out. So we were arguing over it and my brother had two, right? And they were two of the same kind. What's that? That's what's wrong with them. <laughs> but there's two cards, and I'm like, hey, Dylan, how about, you know, since you love me, I'm your brother, right? I mean, you got two cards. How about you give me one of those cards? He's got one just like that. He's got one just like it, so why can't I just have one of those and he have the other and we'll both be happy? And he's like, no, I, these are both mine, and I'm not giving you one. And so we got an argument about it. My mom said, hush, or I'm throwing them both out. And we didn't listen, okay? We thought she was bluffing. I mean, she's not going to throw these cards out. One day, they're going to be worth lots of money, is what we were saying, like the Beanie Babies. And so she said, give me the cards. And we were like, no, she's not going to do it. And then she rolls down the window. I'm like, she's bluffing. She's bluffing. No, she threw them right out. And they were gone. So 
sometimes God gives us a warning, okay? And I think he's very patient. Like the people in 1 Corinthians 11, it doesn't say they just immediately started dropping like flies. I mean, it says they were sickly, they were weak. And so apparently this is a process and God was trying to get their attention in it, but they weren't listening. And so they went to sleep in the Lord and thus chastened um, of God. So in this case, he's saying that there is a sin that is unto death. Some people take this in the spiritual sense, but there are so many examples of death, um, physical death being chastening all throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament that I think we would be in error if we immediately assume that. Um, so moving on, so that's point two, prayers should focus on the spirituality of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's look at verse 18. And I love this verse. This is one that I've really enjoyed picking apart. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Um, so in chapter 3, verse 9, John said something very similar to this, and we talked about it in the past. We kind of want to recap it. In chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. That's a reference to eternal life. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, many translations try to tone that down somewhat. Um, this is where we get into the issue of a formal equivalence translation versus a dynamic equivalence one. So many people would say, well, when it says commit sin, it's talking about habitual sin. And so God is saying that a born again person does not habitually sin. And so that's the interpretation. But the text in Greek doesn't literally say that, so it's best just to leave it as it is, and then we can discuss it in commentaries. Okay, what does John mean? Well, John in chapter 1 says, if anybody says they are without sin at any, any given time, as a believer, as a brother or sister in Christ, that they are lying and the truth is not in them. So what that would imply is sin in one form or another is something that we continually struggle with. And if you continually struggle with something, the word to describe that would be habitual. So habitual sin is something that apparently to one degree or another, we all struggle with and we will until the day Jesus comes back to take us home or we go on to be with the Lord. So it seems a little at odds with what John has said in another place to say that here a born again person does not habitually sin, but yet in chapter one, I'm, I'm implying that we all do. And if you say that you don't, then you're, you're lying. So how do we wrap our minds around this? Well, the key is what it means to be born again. Okay. In verse number nine, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now, let's think about this. If you are born of God, then you've been given a new nature. And in John's thought, that new nature is a nature from above. In fact, in John chapter 3, verse 3, when it says born again, born above is like a play on words there. It could be translated either and probably means both. Be born from above, to be born again. Yes, we need a new birth that's not our second birth or first birth. <laughs> so born again but we also have to be born above and receive eternal life, that engrafted supernatural life. And how do we receive that? When the Holy Spirit comes into us and indwells us. And, and how does that happen? Like, or uh, what is the, the thing that we have to do? Now, some people would say, well, you do nothing. Okay, so the, the Calvinistic interpretation would say that God doesn't. You really don't have any choice. And faith comes as a, uh, a sign of that, that you've already been born again. So being born again happens before you have faith. I would say... That's reading into the text a whole lot that's not there. So scripture says that you believe and being born again is an instantaneous act that happens with that faith, but faith is the, the prerequisite. So I do believe that when you're, when you're believing in Christ for the first time, that it happens in the twinkling of an eye, just like the resurrection will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Um, so it, it's so quick that it's kind of like you can't construe it as faith and then there's an interval and then you're born again. It happens immediately. But there is a logical priority there. Belief logically is prior to being born again. And so when you're born again with this supernatural engrafted life, you have a new nature. Now, is the life of God in any way unholy or tainted by sin? None, okay? So that's why in Romans chapter 7, and we'll go there in a minute, Paul is able to say that in the inner man, I always delight after the law of God. And John is essentially saying the same thing here. He's saying that the born-again person as such, as a born-again person, never sins. So how do you reconcile that? How do you say, okay, well, you got a perfect nature, but I don't live perfect, okay? That's one of those conundrums 
that we have to go to the Word of God to find the answer to. But, buddy, and, yes. when, we, when we're saved, all our sins are covered all the way back to all the way in the future. And to me, that's what it means. I, I agree with you. But when it talks about being born again, it's not just in a justification sense. And I think that this is such an insightful thing to understand. Justification and regeneration are related to each other, but they're not identical. So justification means you're cleared of guilt in the eyes of God. So it's a courtroom term that's being used, okay? Cleared of guilt. But regeneration's not exactly the same thing. Regeneration means you have a new nature that according to John, this new nature is incapable of being unholy. So it's sort of like we are in our inner man, as Paul would say, we're in a holy of holies. And that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. And the Holy Spirit is able to dwell in us because we have been washed clean and made pure in the, in the eyes of God. So in reality, what would I be if I was to die right now and I'm no longer on this plane of existence? I'm, I'm not on earth anymore. I'm not in the flesh anymore. I'm with the Lord. Would there be any sin at all attached to me? And again, we have to use physical analogies because, okay, so I'm not saying that sin is a physical thing like dirt, but it's an analogy in scripture to be washed, right? So it's not an analogy that's violating in any, in any sense what God says in his word. But there would be nothing in me before God that would be impure because nothing impure, sinful, will be permitted into the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said you had to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. So this is referring to what's called positional truth versus practical truth. So positionally, okay, I'm a born-again person. I was born again ever since I accepted Christ when I was six years old. But practically, do I always act in accordance with who I am? Do I always follow the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit tells me to go this way or that way? No, I don't. But that doesn't change the fact that I am a child of God in the midst of that rebellion. And so in verse 18, again, going back to 1 John 5, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Now, some translations say God keepeth him. This is where you get to a textual disagreement. Uh, modern Greek texts say keep him. And the traditional Greek texts say keepeth himself. Okay, I, I believe that the traditional text is the better one. That's what I go with. Um, I'm not going to get into that debate. Um, if you want to know why I believe in the traditional text as opposed to the, the newer critical one, I'd be happy to discuss that with you. But right here, when it says keep it himself, that means he is keeping himself pure. In fact, the same term is used elsewhere in uh, 1 Corinthians to talk about uh, um, either a father. It's, it's kind of hard in interpretation to decide which is which. But um, most people think that in 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking about a father who is keeping his daughter from being married. So he's keeping her a maiden and he's not giving his daughter over to be married. Um, some people think that it's a, a young man and a young woman who have a relationship, okay? They're thinking about marriage, um, but they decide to not go forward with it and they decide to not get married, okay? So, but the word keep there, even it's, though it's in a different context, the idea is keep in one state. So let's say, let's say later on today, okay? I am filled with the joy of the Lord, okay? And I am being kind to those around me. I'm loving the brothers, okay? And I'm loving the sisters, Okay, I'm not fighting with my wife. Okay, I'm, I'm disciplining my kids or raising my kids correctly and I'm not being wrathful, not provoking them to wrath. Let's say I'm doing good. And then all of a sudden I lose my temper and I become wrathful. And it's not righteous wrath, it's sinful anger. Okay, let's say that happens. If I was to die right then, what is the state of my spirit in the eyes of God? According to John, the one who's born of God keepeth himself. So there is, um, th there is a spirit within every single one of us. We are spirits with bodies, not bodies with spirits. We're fundamentally spirit. And fundamentally, I'm a child of God. That's my identity in Christ now that I've been saved. And so John, I think, follows up verse 17 with verse 18 because he's reminding us that, look, all unrighteousness is sin. Okay, now there's some sin that's more serious than others. Some sin can result in the death that he talks about, and some sin is not going to result in death. Okay, uh, if I pop off and I say something unkind to somebody, God's probably not going to strike me down like Ananias and Sapphira, okay? However, if I was to habitually sin against God and I was to continue test those boundaries, then God might at some point say, okay, like the first Corinthians group that we just looked at, all right, I'm going to give you a warning. I'm going to give you a warning. He's patient with us. He's kind. 
but eventually it might go to the point of physical death. And, and here's the thing, guys, we don't know. We never know. So I don't believe in judging that, okay? Um, and I think James 5 illustrates that perfectly. He says, if there has been sin committed, then God will forgive him of that sin and raise him up. So sometimes, or most of the time, probably, our physical issues have nothing to do with sin in our life, but it can have a correlation. And that's taught often in scripture. It's not up to us. I don't judge, okay, when it comes to that. I would pray. Now, if I did see a person who I knew well enough to say, this person's a believer, okay, I know them. I've heard their testimony. I've seen their walk with the Lord. And there are certain people I think we know well enough to say, we have a good idea this person knows Jesus, okay? If I saw them sinning against God, okay, and I started to see their life going downhill, Perhaps I might have that suspicion. I still wouldn't know, okay? But I might pray to God about it because I would have a suspicion. What about somebody that's abusing their body and, and to, and to death? Well, th there might be a, a correlation there. In the case of Mama, my mom, she was an, an alcoholic, and she abused her body for years. And, yeah. um, and I think that in her case, there was repentance on occasion, but it, she kept relapsing into the same. And when I would talk with her about it, she would express the fact that she knew anytime she went back to alcohol, she knew she was not in fellowship with God. Like she knew she was doing something wrong as a child. She felt convicted. Like she really felt like she was doing wrong uh, and she never stopped witnessing. Okay. So her faith was stable throughout that whole time, but she wasn't letting her faith dominate all of her life. And she was letting this sin have control over her life. And so there were times where she'd break free from that, but she'd go back. And I think that God was very patient with her. There was one time my mom, she got in a horrible car accident and she flew out the side of the car door. Like, I mean, there was that much of the window open. I mean, and her body got out of it. Okay. She slipped out. Um, yeah. And, and the people who found her were like, how did, where, why is she over here when the car's over there? It was kind of like, you know, crime scene investigation. Like, how did this happen? Like reconstructing it. It was very odd. And my mom was convinced that it was an angel. Uh, giving her another chance, you know, warning, God was warning her. Okay. This could have happened, but I stopped it. Okay. So I'm about to turn this car around and it could have been now. I don't know. Okay. But, uh, she, she at least believed that that was the case. And, um, right before my mom passed away, she had lots of health problems and most, not all, but most of these health problems were the way she treated her body. I mean, she did abuse her body in many ways and not just for alcohol. I mean, other things as well. But um, right before my mom passed away, we had a hard time because we found alcohol in her closet again. And um, it was one of those things like, man, you were doing so good. But she had been hiding this for a while. And so it was tough. You know, Nana basically said, all right, you can't live with me anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to leave you on the street. We're going to find a place for you, but you can't stay here anymore. So it was a case of, I'm not separating you completely. I'm not casting you off, but there will be discipline. The discipline in this case yeah, is, I feel guilty about that. you know, and it's because you loved her so much, but we helped her. We helped her find a place. And, um, it wasn't very long after that, that she passed away. And I think that in her case, it may have been God was both merciful, but also showing his hand of discipline too. I think it's possible for them to both happen at the same was time. Was she here with um, you when she passed away? No, she, she was up in LJ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what I think that I, what I'm trying to say through all that is my mom, when she got saved, and I don't know when she got saved, uh, Nana probably knows more about her testimony, but when she got saved, she became a child of God, a daughter of God. And she raised me up in the word. Um, I knew about Jesus from her. Um, even when she was sinning against God, she always encouraged me to serve the Lord. Um, she always reminded me of my calling and encouraged me. And uh, her new nature was coming through in all of that. I could see it. But there were other things in her life where she was like, no, God, I, I don't want that. And she, she pushed God down. Um, like Stephen said, you know, you always resist the Holy Spirit. I think in many aspects of my mom's life as a believer, she was resisting the Holy Spirit. But verse 18 reminds us that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and the wicked one toucheth him not. There's certain things the devil can't do to a believer anymore now that we've been saved. Now let's uh, look at point three and we'll wrap it up because we're kind of running out of time. We're getting hungry. All right. So point three, sin does not endanger the sanctified position of the believer. 
So there's, there's a positional sanctification. You're born again. You're not born again and again and again and again. There's no evidence for that in Scripture. However, we have to learn to subdue, or as Paul would say, mortify the flesh. And it's a practice, and that's practical sanctification. I'm not saying because I'm a child of God that I've got it all <laughs> under control in my life. I still struggle with my sin nature, but I'm doing my best to mortify that so that way my new nature comes across in my life that y'all can see the light of Christ in me rather than taking that light and putting a shade around it where people can't see it or they only see something dim. I want it to be blazing bright. So that point three, sin does not endanger the sanctified position of the believer. Now, let's move on to verse number 19. And if y'all want to look up Romans 7, I said we'd look at it. Uh, look at chapter 7, the whole chapter. But specifically, I'd encourage you to look up chapter 7, verse 20. Chapter 7, verse 20. So y'all can look that up in your own time. Let's move on to verses 19 through 21. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and, the, and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. This last point, number four, is acting on our position keeps us practically holy. Um, often throughout this, this letter, not just this letter, really the whole New Testament, what you'll see a lot is Paul saying, you've been washed. You've been justified. You've been sanctified. Therefore, don't live the way you used to be. That's not how you are anymore. You've died with Christ. So act like you've died with Christ and you're risen again. And so that position that they have now as saved people is constantly appealed to all throughout the New Testament. And here in verse 19, he says, we know that we are of God. I think this may be the apostles, of course, but more than that. I think he's talking to everybody. He's getting them all in there because he's already said that they weren't listening to the Gnostics. He was saying you could, so don't do it. <laughs> but he's saying, I'm confident regarding you. And if you go back to chapter two, he talks about the young men. And he talks about the elders and he calls the little children, um, you know, faithful. They're trusting in God. And he talks about all the positive things they got going for them in, the, in their life right now. But right here, I think he's getting everybody in and says, we know that we are of God. Now, of God here is, of course, a little bit different than being born of God. Born of God is an act. Here, from God is we're sent from God. He's like, we are from God. You know, these uh, false prophets, these Gnostics that are coming in your midst, they're not of God. They're not from God. Okay? They're from the world. They're from the evil one. But we are from God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So that's their position. Why does the world act wickedly? Why did the Gnostics preach lies? Because they themselves had been deceived. They were wicked in their teaching and wicked in their practice because that's who they were. And that's who we all were before we got saved. And that's why we need to pray for these people that they come to repentance. But he's saying, we know that we are of God. We are in fellowship with him. In verse 20, we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding. Why are we from God? Why are we in fellowship with him and walking in a way that pleases him? Because God gave us that understanding. And we pray that he will give other people an understanding. I know everybody in here has people you know that are unbelievers and you hope that God will give them that understanding. But that's a two-way street. Okay? God gives the understanding by convicting, by drawing, but as I already stated in Acts 7, Stephen said to those people, the Sanhedrin, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And so it can be done. But we pray that they will not do that. And so they will have the same understanding we have so that they may know him that is true. Knowing God is more than just knowing, okay, well, I'm justified. I'm saved. Knowing God is progressive. Wouldn't y'all agree that when you first accepted Christ, you knew God so much, but now you know him a whole lot better. You should be going in that direction, right? You know God better now than you did back then. So John's saying, we now know God. We have fellowship with God. And the more we walk in the light, the more we are aware of our own sins and failings and we humble ourselves, the more we will know him better. We are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. By the way, verse 20 has been used often as a defense for the deity of Christ. And I think it's a good defense when it says, even in his son, Jesus Christ. And then it says, this is the true God and eternal life. What does this refer back to? Well, Jesus is the most um, logical antecedent there. He just said Jesus Christ. And then he says, this is the true God in eternal life. And, and that expression 
or rather word, this in Greek, is never used of the Father anywhere in the New Testament. But it's often used of Jesus. So it seems that John here is, in a way we could all expect and understand, calling Jesus the true God in eternal life. However, if we were to say, well, true God refers to the Father and eternal life refers to Jesus, it wouldn't change anything. We know that John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that Jesus is the Word who was with God and who is God. Uh, we know that in verse 7, it says, For there are three there bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So I think it's funny. People will debate over this, especially cults who try to twist Scripture and take away the deity of Jesus. Take away the, the high, highest uh, authority and glory that he deserves. They try to take that from him, rob him of that. They can't do it, but they try to by the twisting of Scripture. They'll take this verse and they'll argue about it. But what's funny is the reason there's an argument, the reason people fight over this verse is because it seems to put Jesus and God on the same level. And that's why cults have this burden on them to try to explain it away. Because it's so obvious. Why is it that consistently all throughout the New Testament that the Son and the Holy Spirit are put on the same level as God the Father? Why are they called one? Why is Jesus in Philippians 2 called equal with God? Why is John in John 5 verse 18 say that Jesus made himself God's equal because he was calling himself the Son of God? Okay, it's clear that the New Testament authors were putting the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit on that same level because they are one. And we believe as Christians in one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But lastly, guys, uh, verse number 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And you know what's interesting, guys? Idols in the literal sense, like the worshiping of false gods is becoming so prominent now um, in our country. We're seeing paganism on the rise. And I think that this admonition, um, this exhortation, what have you, Keep yourselves from idols. It's becoming more important now than ever. We have to make sure that we know who Jesus is. He's the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Not to move him down from that pedestal that he belongs on. He's on his throne in the Word of God, and he should be on his throne in our minds. And we need to make sure that we understand what we have in him, eternal life. And that is how you sum up the book of 1 John. Who is Jesus? And what is eternal life? Number four is, I thought I said it, but if I didn't, I'll say it again. Acting on our position keeps us practically holy. So I don't want to just come before the Lord as a saved person. I want to come before the Lord as a saved and victorious believer. Um, David had some moments in his life where he wasn't very victorious, was he? But he had other moments like we talked about earlier this week where he went and he conquered the heathen nations and he brought into the temple of God spoils. Well, I know that's not something God's commanded us to do. I think it's strong imagery for the fact that we as Christians can live victorious lives if we understand who we are in Christ and we live that way, just like we're told to. So with that, God bless, and we're going to eat now. Bye. Bye.